Well, it was a very interesting way to grow up, and it had a lot of advantages uh, that were unseen at the time. As a farm kid, you wake up in the morning and do chores, and then have breakfast and go to school, and then play football, and come back and do chores. So hard work was part of what was the fabric of, of how I grew up. And um, in junior college, I had a friend that was fishing uh, southeast Alaska on uh, salmon seine boats and got me a position. And the bottom end of the totem pole in, the, in that industry is that you're the cook. With that money, I went to the University of Washington for a quarter and met an Austrian exchange student who was the Austrian national collegiate champion in ski racing. And I was an aspiring ski racer, so I ended up following him to Jackson Hole and worked for his brother and had the good fortune of working under a European trained chef where I began to learn something about real cooking. And then from there I followed my pursuit in culinary and in uh, restaurant management. I talked to a friend um, that was in the restaurant supply business, Sam Bargreen, who the legacy is still there with Bargreen Ellingston. And Sam said, you know, you gotta look at Ray's Boathouse. It's kind of run down, but there might be an opportunity there. You know, I came out and took a look at it and went, wow, this is really neat, but boy, it's falling down. But being a farm kid, all right. So you're gonna tear up some boards and put some new ones down and build a deal. You, you know how to do that because you've done that all your life, farming. So that was kind of the, the, the genesis of the idea of Ray's Boathouse. And I had a lot of uh, experience in steakhouses. So my thought was, all right, we buy really good fish from fishermen and we broil it on a broiler as opposed to wrapping breading around it and putting it in, in a deep fryer. And we would do mostly that kind of cooking, sauteing as opposed to deep frying, which was kind of where Seattle was at that time. It wasn't a gourmet seafood city that it is today. So when we bought it, um... It was a smaller building than it is now. It was only one floor, and out in front where the view is, there was a great big pen, and the pen had seals in it. And then when you came in the restaurant, it was just a downstairs restaurant, and at the south end was a bar. And the restaurant, or the bar was half of the restaurant, and in the floor of the bar was a window and they could turn on lights that would shine down there. So you could go in the bar and you could watch the fish and, and whatever was going on down there in the light. And Ray was still alive at the time and when we were remodeling, Ray would come down and show us where water pipes were and chat with us about things. So the, the legacy of Ray Lichtenberger really lived on in the space at the time that we were building it. And Ray had some great sage advice. We still ran the boathouse facility. We had 300 Rhinel Cedar boats at the time we bought it. And we ran salmon derbies and rented boats to people. And I had a friend that came into the restaurant that I was running at the time in Bellevue, which was part of the hindquarter group, whose name was Duke Mosgrit. Duke was a smooth talking finance guy and he knew a young lawyer in town who could put together deals that was Earl Asher. I uh, was a budding young lawyer and um, was in the process of starting a law firm. I was working for another firm and uh, my stockbroker was a guy named Duke Mosgrip and, and Duke was the one who introduced me to uh, Russ. Russ came to me and said he was interested in um, a restaurant and um, he had been working in Sun Valley and he said I don't have any money and I just got married and um, I've got to figure out a way to to get involved in this and I said which restaurant and he said it was one out at Chilshoe Bay. So it was through Duke that I got to know Earl and Earl and Duke and I put together Ray's and managed to uh, negotiate with the then owner, which is a guy named Jack Klein, who had purchased it from 
Ray Lichtenberger, and the problem really was neither one of us had any money, and um, so we had to figure out how to do it. The doctor uh, agreed to um, subordinate his contract uh, to us, to the banks, so that we could get the loan, but he said, I'll only do that in the case that you uh, give me $50,000 in gold coins. And at that time, gold was worth about $38 an ounce, and it was set at that amount. We gave him the gold for $50,000 of gold coins, and, um, and the bank loaned us the money, and uh, that's how we got started. So we got people in there, and we started making lights, and we started doing all kinds of stuff, and it took us four or five months, as I recall. And we opened the restaurant, I think it was in May of 73, well, interestingly enough, we've only had uh, five partners, um, four partners for most of the time. We now have five. When Duke left, um, uh, then Elizabeth Gindrich got involved, and we met her through a, a seminar process that we went to. Earl and Russ and Duke Moskrip had a parting of the ways, and they were looking for someone to buy Duke out. And I think that Russ and Earl felt that my mom was a good fit and would bring a lot of positive energy to the restaurant. And they asked her and she decided it was a good fit as well. Her favorite part about being a part of Ray's um, was the connections she made with people. Um, she was a real people person and she um, enjoyed the interaction with everyone from the kitchen staff to the wait staff to the management staff. And um, that's what she enjoyed the most. We had two managers that had become partners who were really good. We had gotten very ambitious and thought we were just the hottest deal in town and had built a couple other restaurants which didn't work too well. Well, the managers decided that they didn't want to be part of our organization because we had made some mistakes and they needed to be bought out. Well, I knew of Jack Sigma through basketball and in town because they had just won the national championship and I knew a mutual friend of his. In 1977, I, I came to Seattle uh, to play for the Sonics, and our trainer was a sailor, and he had a sailboat here in Shulshul. And uh, after the season was over in the summer, he would take it out a lot and invited us to, to join him, which I did at one time. And afterwards, we stopped by Ray's for a uh, bite to eat in the evening. And uh, just, it was Seattle, you know, the waterfront restaurant, the activities out front, so it, it was pleasing. And then, and then after discovering it, um, I had a group of friends that, particularly in the summer, that we'd make sure we made a few treks here to Ray's Boathouse. One of the front of the house uh, hostesses was a good friend of my fiance at the time, and uh, got to know her. And when they were looking for uh, another partner, she mentioned to Russ that she knew me and, and basically I got a phone call out of the blue from Russ. Driving across the bridge one day in my Volkswagen Rabbit with a, a car phone in it, I called him up and said, hey, I may have an opportunity. Do you, you think you're interested? And he said, yeah, I'll have my business manager call you. And uh, I was intrigued by it. And uh, I had a business manager at the time that I said, hey, could you get a hold of Russ? There's a number of steps we got to go through yet as far as meeting the owners or whatever, but just take a look at the opportunity. And things fell in place. I got a chance to meet and spend some time with Russ and Earl and Elizabeth, uh, and it felt comfortable. In 1983, I became a part owner of Ray's. And of course, Jack was, um, interesting because he represented a whole different group of people 
um, and he was just enough younger than we were to bring in that kind of next level in. There was this intellectual guy named John Raleigh that would come and hang out and he'd tell me about salmon guys that were really doing a better job. Well, in fact, he had been in Alaska fishing in Southeast a couple years after my last year there. So we had some kinship and, and John was very interesting in that he, early in his early days, he found resources that I couldn't find. He had exposed us to the idea of this incredible early run of salmon that came from the Copper River. So he had come across this fish up in Alaska in the Copper River where they were taking the fish and running through a processing plant, putting them in cans and putting them in the grocery store shelf. And they would sit in cans forever until someone bought them. Um, and he saw this animal and he said, well, these things are just circling around in the sound eating shrimp until they're fat enough to run up the river. Um, and they're just beautiful animals. It's a long river, so they have to get a lot of fat to make that journey. Um, and he had said, what if we took this to the States and we marketed it correctly? Would they be able to pay for it? So he created, he was smart and helped create a demand that would satisfy the need to harvest the fish up way up there and, and treat it special. It was the, the one of the first fish that was recognized as its own thing. It was opposed to just, I'm going to a restaurant and I'm gonna buy salmon. You got it from a certain river. They were fabulous fish, real fat. I mean, they were dripping with wonderful, wonderful flavor and oils. So the, the season then came on and we sent John up there with a, uh, the mission to find the best fish, get them from Cordova to Anchorage, get them from Anchorage to here, and we bought, I don't know how many, but a, a bunch of Copper River fish, and we were proud to think that we were one of the first restaurants in town to serve them. And it's an amazing animal to get. It's, it's, it's amazing to see the process up in Cordova. Um, it's amazing to see it when it lands here and all the fervor. Um, and the prices may be a little high, but it is, in my opinion, it's, it's what salmon should be. Uh, Cordova was amazing, um, beautiful. Uh, from the flight in, uh, to the fact that it was 72 degrees when we got there. The night before the actual opener, uh, we had hooked up with um, a good friend of Davis's who, who from, from Ocean Beauty. Uh, her name was Janelle, and she brought us to this cool beach uh, on, on the side of uh, another river or a, a tributary to the sound there. And we watched in the distance the boats leaving the harbor, getting out there before nightfall. So they were gonna stay the night out there. Um, I would say that's what, that was one of my first impressions, and I think that uh, it was one of the longest lastings. Being able to just sit there and watch them head out full speed, uh, the sun never fully setting, just kind of playing with the, the tree line of the mountain. So that evening we, we were able to walk out onto the jetty and watch them all come back in, and that was pretty powerful as well. Cordova's beautiful. Yeah. It was John Rowley who was a marketing genius and got people to recognize that this fish was special as opposed to BC King. That, that there really is a difference between the fish and if you work with fish enough you understand that there's a difference but a lot of times people don't see that on their plate. At that time there was a ambitious group of people that were wine brokers in South Seattle and some of the staff and myself went down for a little tasting. It was a barrel tasting of Oregon Pinot Noir. And then I learned that it was Pomard Clone, pure Pomard Clone. So I said, this is fabulous. This wine will drink really well with Copper River Salmon, with King Salmon. And at that point, nobody drank red wines with fish, particularly, but it works super well, especially the Pomard Clone. Well, of course, one of the great local wines in the area, the Willamette Valley Pinot Noir, is easily one of the greatest regions in the world for Pinot Noir is the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, one of the great pairings is that Pinot Noir and fresh wild king salmon. And it's, it's funny because a lot of people ascribe to the classic myth that you should drink white wine with fish. 
and red wine with, with steaks. And that's true to a certain extent, but Pinot Noir and salmon is one of those great pairings that really goes against that model because salmon, especially that incredible wild, fresh, Northwest King Salmon and Copper River Salmon specifically has an incredible high oil content. They're very rich, they're very meaty. It's almost steak-like in its incredible texture and richness. So what you need to pair with that is, is a wine that has really a lot of great acidity. Um, and what acid is in wine is it's what makes wine really refreshing. It's what cleanses the palate. It's what can wash those incredible fatty oils off of your palate and complement the richness of the fish. And Willamette Valley is fortunate because the growing conditions are just cold enough that they are able to retain great acidity in those Pinot Noir grapes. You match that with the earthy minerality of some of those Pinot, Pinot Noirs from Oregon, as well as some of their delicate dark and red berry flavors. And it's just a perfect combination to those rich local salmon. About 84, this fisherman walked into, into the back of the kitchen named Bruce Gore. And Bruce Gore was promoting FAS King Salmon and Silver Salmon. FAS means frozen at sea. So Bruce was very, very particular, and this is a long time ago, in the way he harvested the fish. They were frozen within you know, 18 hours of being out of the water. So they were frozen on purpose, not frozen as the last resort to be able to sell the fish. Then there was another guy that was very influential, Chuck Bundren. And at that time, Chuck was just getting started with Trident and was a big king crab supplier. So Chuck would literally deliver king crab to us out of the back of his family station wagon. There was a guy named Mac Yamagata who turned us on to the idea of um, sakikasu, very traditional Japanese thing. Well, the process of, of making the sable fish in sake kasu um, is uh, historical. Uh, I think that Ray's brought it, definitely brought it to the Northwest. The process is taking the, the, um, uh, the aftermath of the sake making process, so the mash. And we just take that and uh, we mix it with a little bit of uh, sugar um, and some water. The fish itself is filleted when it comes in into sides and then we salt cure it. Uh, so we try to salt cure it for about eight hours. Um, it's rinsed and then it's, um, the fish is then cut into portions, whatever size we're using, eight to six ounce and then, um, then it is submerged in the, uh, the actual paste that we've created from the sake leaves. That marinade uh, has uh, essential sugars and it just kind of caramelizes on the fish and it gives it that, that added depth of flavor. Uh, there was a guy named Hump Nelson who in 1983 or four was older than I am today. But he had grown up as an oysterman in South Puget Sound along with uh, another fellow named Dwayne Foggergren, who was uh, an oysterman. Uh, the Olympias were all grown on beaches, so a lot of handwork. So we got to go down and spend time sorting through Olympias with them. Then um, there was a thought, either with John Raleigh or myself or with Monty or with the whole group over a good bottle of wine, that maybe there were some writers from New York City that we could entice to come out and take a look at what we have in the Northwest. So with no strings attached, we offered an opportunity for this couple to come to the Northwest. I flew them around Puget Sound and showed them the things that we had here. The Hoog brothers took them to Eastern Washington. I think two or three months after their visit, there was an eight page article about the bounty of the Northwest and the young chefs that were here taking advantage of this incredible product that, that came from the land and the sea in the local area. So that was the beginning of the definition of what we call today you know, Northwest cuisine. Well, John did the same thing. Um, he wanted to, he found some Olympia oysters. They grow naturally out here in the South Sound um, and they were harvested almost to extinction and they again were put into jars and put on the grocery store shelves because they were abundant. You can walk down the beach and pick them up. Um, and they were almost extinct. Uh, 
and he had to convince oyster growers to grow them. And from a seed to an adult Olympia oyster is four to five years. So to, in order to convince the shellfish farmers to plant these, he had to come up with demand. So he had a grower grow some, and four years later, they harvested them. And I believe this is 1983. He did a, um, a large promotion here, again, trusting Ray's and us trusting John with the quality and him trusting Ray's with the execution. Uh, we partnered and did a, um, a media-only event for the entire West Coast where we offered only thing on the menu was Olympia oysters on the half shell and Schramsberg sparkling wine from California. Um, it was a huge hit, made the New York Times, helped build the industry, helped shellfish farmers understand that it is a profitable thing, helped the guests understand that uh, it is worth the price. Um, they're, they're really unique um, and it's neat to have something rebound like that. And at that time the dock was built three, uh, two feet above the high water line. So as it turned out, the fire was started by a um, product that helped us keep the pipes from freezing underneath the dock. And it happened at high tide. So there was almost no way that the fire boats, which were here, could do very much to subdue the fire. Well, if you go back to the uh time of that fire and the next day I was on the front page of the paper sitting like this watching it thinking oh my god it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and the TV was on and especially you know, they broke in and raised it on fire and I looked at my wife and, and so I right away uh, uh, called Earl I believe and he says yeah I'm on my way over there it's this is real so we uh, hopped in a car and uh, I think my wife was uh, seven months pregnant or something like that at the time. And uh, we came here and all the owners had basically made it here. And uh, as the fire wound down and uh, got under control, we went next door. I think it was Azteca at that point in time and just sat down and said, okay, let's get our feet in the ground. And the choice we had was we're gonna be out of the business or we're gonna be in the business. And, we had a pretty good following and we'd done fairly well so we just we built this facility you know it was it was right away we wanted we wanted it back we were going to rebuild and you know, the, what's the steps that need to be taken the uh, fire was may 23rd 1987 started at six o'clock at night the restaurant was full of people they all filed out with their plates and Fire department moved them off a little ways, and later on I'd get checks in the mail from people that, we had a great meal, but we did never pay for it, so here's our check, which was fantastic. We were good friends with the mayor of Seattle at the time, we were friends of enough so that we were able to uh, get our permits and get back on our feet fairly fast. And um, so we, got, we had some insurance, but we wanted to build a bigger building than we had, and we uh, wanted to move it in a different way. When we rebuilt Ray's, we rebuilt the same restaurant, but a little bit updated. And there was a, a big impact by code updates and things that had to be done. Right. We'd gotten to know Julia through John Raleigh and Monty Caseberg. And, she had been here and was very curious about our seafood program. So we challenged her to the idea that we thought we could provide her better fish that was frozen, FAS, frozen at sea, on purpose, at the peak of its freshness, than she could uh, provide with fresh fish. So we had this tasting, and Julia was absolutely astounded to pick the fish that she thought was the best. And as I remember, it was an 18 month old frozen white king salmon. And then she featured it on our cooking show at the time, which was sometime in 87, 88, during that time period. Then when Julia was in town, she would oftentimes come here. And on one of those visits, um, I flew around the Puget Sound, Nia Bay, uh, Willapa Harbor. So it was through Julia that we got an introduction to the James Beard Society. And we went back 
cooked for them several times and eventually received an award for that. James Beard Society, I think, is quite influential in the country. It gave us notoriety. It's, it, 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 um, it gave us a national notoriety. Um, you know, an award like that is something that people who are interested in food and wine uh, really notice. It felt good to be recognized and we uh, and, and very deserved. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll go back to I, I especially uh, feel uh, that our early owners were responsible for that vision and, and, and should take tremendous credit on, on, on that award. Um, it's something that we ha keep hanging in the kitchen and we all look at often. Um, but it, it's nice to be acknowledged by your peers and by a, a higher organization for, for doing the right thing and for, for taking a chance on fresh, wild, sustainable and, and organic and good for the environment. And these were, these were things that people weren't even, didn't even have on their radar. Um, so from 1973 to 2002, we, we kept that uh, hell or high water. We, we stayed that course um, and they acknowledged us for that. A piece of the Ray's experience is positive energy. It's a nice place to be. Sometimes people would come and just say, I just want to be here. You know, I'm not going to drink a lot because I don't want to get drunk, but can I just be here? And the answer was, of course. And that, that positive energy is a big piece of what makes Ray's Ray's. The Ray's experience in the beginning was a, um, a young, uh, kind of vibrant place to go that had a, a great view that was a nice place to be in the sun and all that. But um, Russ, um, really, we, both, we all got involved with the idea that what we're going to do is have great product. We're going to go for the best fish we could get and do it as best we could, but it's going to be simple. Being raised for 45 years has one benefit um, that a lot of restaurants don't have is that the guests have already defined who we are. They know when they come to Ray's, they know what they're going to get. There's an expectation when they come here. Ray's has a brand and a brand promise that we provide for all of our guests. New restaurants that start out have to find out what that is. Um, our guests, from this tenure, our guests are telling us what we are. We have to listen and we have to make good on that promise. It's, it's um, sustainably harvested wild seafood from uh, as local as we can get. It's honoring our partnerships with our purveyors. Anything that's coming through that is fresh and here and now, um, the clientele trusts that we buy that sustainably, um, that we prepare it um, in a true fashion with Ray's is simple and light and letting the flavor shine through. And we do it with a service that's appropriate for their experience, whether it's upstairs in the busy bustling cafe or it's a quiet dinner for two downstairs or uh, it's plated differently for a, a wedding for 100 people in the Northwestern. Ray's is definitely a family as a company, and the people that work here are really happy to be here, and, and we're happy to see each other every day. And I think when you're interacting with the guests, that shows that um, we're all a big family, and, and we're happy to be here, and we're happy that those people are coming to visit us. Well, I think. A huge reason is they've been coming here for generations. So, the um, you know the third generation of the families, the grandparents and the great grandparents, remember the fishing derbies and renting the boats, and you know when Ray's burnt down and when it was just a bait house. And so they'll bring their kids here, and then the kids start having first dates here, and then they get married in the Northwest Room, and then they come for every anniversary, and then their children come. So I just really think it's a Seattle mainstay that is kind of, you know, just remains popular family, family generation after generation. I think that's, um, I, I think it sums up the entirety of, of what we provide here. Uh, and I, I think that we, we would start with uh, the staff and how welcome we are and have always been. Uh, we are definitely a neighborhood restaurant as much as we are a destination restaurant. Uh, you know, people are in tune with, with the changes that we make, however subtle they may be. I think the experience is just walking through the door, um, the uh, interaction with, with the staff, um, 
the desire for uh, complete and well-balanced cuisine. Obviously a lovely view. Um, being able to fulfill people's expectations, whether it's their hundredth time or their first time, I think that's what it's all about. And you know, we try and we succeed. It's, 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 it's a lot of things. It's a customer experience. It's keeping the uh, building and uh, the ambiance uh, clean and up to date. It's a, a huge focus on what the uh, patrons want and taking care of them. Um, it's about making a contribution to the overall community and, and even as big as Seattle. Uh, as we grew, we became much more known again as part of Seattle. And I think, um, you know, uh, Doug is going to be a great inventive guy. He's going to keep that going. And uh, I probably won't be around to see it. <laughs>
I started as a line cook in banquets. And um, Charles took a chance on me and, and pushed me forward to the point where I was in management in the kitchen. Um, the ownership saw me grow and the, the controller that was in place at the time saw that I had talent. Um, and they, at the time, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. Carolyn and the general manager at the time made me an offer and said, if you're willing to go back to school and get your master's in accounting, we have a job for you. And um, then worked with me for the next four years while I was going, I was still managing the kitchen and going to night school. And uh, when I graduated, she retired. Not only does Tom have the understanding of food and how food works, but he also has an understanding of how the numbers work. And Tom and Doug have really be been a, a brilliant team for us. So with the Doug, Tom, and Chef Paul partnership, those three people really make things happen here. The path that we're going to take into the future is really the path we're on now, and we've done an incredible job at Ray's Boathouse of balancing our history and being true to what Ray's vision is, caring about what we're sourcing, the food we're bringing in, the products we're using, caring about the community we're a part of. Well, the current management and ownership has a lot of conviction with you know serving sustainable seafood and that's going to be a challenge moving forward so hopefully we're always at the forefront of having you know products straight from fishermen that built us up the fishermen that live here um, you know safe fishing practices uh, things that are good and safe for the environment um, just moving forward but always trying to stay you know on trend and providing amazing fresh seafood with the talented staff that, that we have here trying to pioneer another uh, exploration into cuisine and, and dining experience. Uh, such was the case uh, back in the 70s when it uh, first began. Um, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would love it if, if Ray's on Shoal Shoal was still the, the premier destination. And uh, I, I think that uh, I look forward to a lot of success in 20 years. Physically, there could be some things that change with the restaurant over time. There has been in, in the past. We don't want to be stagnant. Um, but what we're known for and stand for, as far as delivery of quality food and service in a beautiful Seattle setting, as long as we continue to do that, um, I'll be happy. I, I would say that it's going to look substantially like it does now. But I think that that's why Doug and Tom, the new people, are both in. They're, they're my kids' age. And um, they will, they will uh, shepherd in the new generation they already have. They've got it started. We've got them not, uh, acquainted with everything. Um, and they kind of know what we stand for and where we are. The art would be different, the music would be different, it would still be the same building, and food will have changed. We're not inventing any new protein, but people are traveling, they have more diverse experience with flavors from different cultures. So there'll be new cultures and new flavors that will, that will happen. Uh, and there will be classic things that don't change because they're just doggone good. So I would expect that 20 years from now, Rays will be much the same and at the same time very different because of the creative flow of, of uh, product development. Soak it up. Um, don't just punch the, punch the clock. It's not a, not a job, it's an experience for you too. Um, and I would, I would tell them to uh, be inquisitive, engage, uh, get the most out of your, your experience here. Uh, and if 
focus on the customer in the, in the sense of uh, you'll learn a lot about people. Listen more than you talk, right? And that's important at a table. Um, understand the brand promise and deliver that. Every guest, every table, every time. Be raised. Understand what it is to be raised, to be working at raise, um, and try and bring that with you every, every day to work. Don't be late. This is, this is a, there's a humanity to this work. You're, you're, you're not sitting at a desk. Uh, and you, you have an impact on uh, every person that comes, comes through here uh, on, on their experience. I knew I wanted to build a great restaurant and that by building a great restaurant we could ensure business success. But um, to have envisioned this at 27 years old, where it is today, was there was nothing like that. There weren't restaurants that existed that were like this 45 years ago. So we kind of invented a new, a new thing, along with a lot of other guys, you know, guys in town like Peter Dow, Tom Douglas. Those guys pushed the envelope and we pushed each other hard all the time because we were competing but in a real friendly way. And we'd trade lies and ideas and try to find new things that made things work better. We kept them a secret a little bit but then we became proud of it, we disclosed what we were doing and that would spur the next bit of creativity among young, young chefs and young restaurant owners, owners in, in the city.